are Tyrians. We are many races, several professions. We practice the arts of combat as well as healing. We have foes, and we fight them without mercy. And it's time for us to claim back what is ours. It's time for us to claim back Tyria from the terror of the Elder Dragons. We can't go on living our lives in fear. We have to fight. We have to make a stand. This is our story. Welcome back, everyone, to the part two of episode seven of Chronicles of Tyria podcast. It's Lag, Dent, Naveen, and Alicard Alina again, and we are going to talk about human lore, a piece of lore that is very near and dear to all of our hearts, being Guild Wars 1 players. Mm -hmm. So, to start, we normally talk about the origin of where ArenaNet came up with the idea for humans, but I think that one's probably pretty obvious, so we'll probably skip that. <laughs> um, the physiology and appearance of humans. I think we can skip that one too because we kind of know what humans look like. <laughs> and the behavior of how humans behave, I think we can also figure that one out too. Yeah. So we're going to skip to relationships and we're going to let Naveen take that. I mean, again, there's some kind of how relationships work. We have some ideas, but... Uh... Yeah, but I mean, you know, it's pretty normal. You know how we work... Well, humans of Tyria is almost the same as us humans, and this is probably why we can easily relate to them. Um, the humans in Guild Wars, they found families, they get married, they have celebrations, they get buried or cremated, they take care of their elders, uh, they have schools and hospitals, orphanages. Uh, I mean, there's not really anything different from us aside from, you know, their religions and war causes. Um <laughs> To be honest, if you have anything you think you might contribute and you think I've missed, <laughs> please let me know. Because, honestly, the relationships are practically the same thing. There is no... nothing. There's nothing. All right. If you're human, you know what relationships are like in-game as a human. Well, let's not alienate any of our fans that don't know what a relationship is in real life. Maybe they don't know. Okay. Well, first there's the bees <laughs> okay. and the birds. Right, never mind. Okay, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, um. <laughs> uh, Naveed, we have children listening, listening to this show. They know about the bees and the birds. Canada. Maybe the birds and the bees over here in America. I don't know. Oh, yeah. back I mean, everything is all backwards. And <laughs> we know about birds and bees. And the beads. And beads? <laughs> I said beads. Did it sound like beads? Totally In Canada. Beads. Are you making a necklace out of birds and beads? Uh, you didn't know? So oh, I Americans. say we go into the religion here before we start talking too much things about the birds and the bees and beads. Because I don't think we want to go there. So, Dint, how about you talk about the religion, the six gods of the humans of Tyria? Yes, Please. I shall. <laughs> <laughs> um, well... Uh, the humans they have they currently have six main gods and those gods are Balthazar, Duena, Grenth, Cormir, Lissa, or um, that's what they uh, refer to it, um, her or them. It's kind of like debated about whether is it a single deity that represents a twin type essence or is it like two actual twin like deities mm -hmm. if it is they refer to um the both of them as lissa but if they're referring to one of them it's liss mm -hmm. um and then the last one is melandru these gods with the exception of cormir are the gods that brought the humans to tyria and as of 200 years ago if we start from the guild wars 2 timeline uh the six gods have withdrawn they are basically just letting the human race take care of itself from now. Even though, like, they will still, like, like occasionally they'll answer prayers and things like that. But basically, they're just kind of like, all right, y'all are grown. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, according to the legend, the gods used to live on Tyria while they were, quote-unquote, creating it. However, um, 
now we all uh, we all know because of uh, the lore in the that we find out in the game that the gods actually didn't create the world they just used to live in the world mm -hmm. and they simply just brought humanity to Tyria um, at basically kind of like you know the time that this happened is really unknown but because you know they didn't really kind of like have a set of time um, but yeah they're the ones that brought humanity to Tyria um, now three of these gods Balthazar, Dwayne, and Melandru <clears throat> they used to actually have a home city um, and that is where or is currently at and they used to call that city ara a r a h um and Ab and it's also rumored that abaddon may have lived there as well but um that's kind of like unclear because every single thing that we know about abaddon has been completely erased um and in the year of 1 be which is basically before exodus um abaddon gave all races uh magic you know the pa the power to use magic um however like you know basically no one was surprised when it happened but everyone abused it um and so there was this chaos everywhere everyone was just basically kind of like blowing everything up <laughs> and so all of the other gods got like really mad at abaddon and so um yeah so the gods sealed um most of that magic away in what are called the bloodstones um, in order to basically reduce the amount of magic that they had access to mm -hmm. and um, to kind of calm everyone down. Abaddon was like real mad when that happened so because he, he didn't want that to happen. You know, he was like, I gave that to them. Why did you take it away? It's kind of you're undermining my authority. And um, so he tried to lead a war against the five gods because Abaddon um, used to be one of the six main gods before Cormir became one of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so he tried to lead a war against the, the other five gods and basically lost and, and was locked in the realm of torment um, for what thought was going to be forever. But play Nightfall to figure out how that goes. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> uh, the other five gods after that point left Tyria for good and then went into quote the mists um which was then called the exodus of the gods now since then since the exodus of the gods um the gods have not really intervened that much in any of the goings on in Tyria although they still you know they 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 watch over the world and this is back in Guild Wars 1 type area mm -hmm. you know they would still watch over the world they would kind of see what's going on but they would never really just kind of like step in and be like, okay, stop it. Y'all are acting cray cray. Um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, but occasionally like if they thought something was like really noteworthy, they would grant the world favor, which is then in Guild Wars one, we would notice, you know, so-and-so got eternal drunkard, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, the gods have extended their favor, <laughs> um, <laughs> which I'm thinking that was Balthazar. He's like, yes, yes, drink up. Um, <laughs> right. Uh, but here recently, um, it has been discovered that some of the realms of the gods, such as like the Underworld, who belongs to Grenth, and Fisher of Woe, who belongs to Balthazar, um, are actually under attack. And when I say recently, I mean like Guild Wars 1 recently. Mm -hmm. um, for example, Doom, uh, the old god of death before Grenth, um, is actually he has like a whole like demonic army going on in the underworld trying to get out of the Hall of Judgment that he's currently locked in when Grenth basically cast him off of the throne as God as the God of Death, um, <clears throat> and so yeah and so that's going on and but uh, also uh, still back in Guild Wars one times Grenth and Duena will actually have a battle quote unquote basically mm -hmm. to kind of gain favor of the races of Tyria and it's their version of a groundhog groundhog day I guess <laughs> because this battle I mean if Grenth wins then winter lasts longer and if Duena wins then winter doesn't last as long and spring comes sooner right. um, yeah uh, most of the humans and, th and this is interesting that you um, Naveen you said that they that their religions are they uh 
you know, you're like, oh, well, we're basically the exact same as the humans minus the religion. Mm -hmm. Now, yes, their religion is different from ours when it comes to the very minute details. Mm -hmm. Um, However, I did notice a lot of similarities between their religion and IRL religion. (laughs) Oh, well, go ahead. I'm intrigued. Yeah, most humans in Guild Wars 2 or Guild Wars, they choose a patron, basically kind of like a patron saint sort of of the six main gods Mm -hmm. and they devote themselves and their entire faith primarily to that god um and this is very similar to modern day pagans Mm -hmm. that we have in real life they you know they 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 choose either like norse mythology celtic mythology greek or roman mythology and even though they acknowledge um you know, all of the gods within that pantheon, they still will pick a patron saint as, as what it's called and devote most of their practice to that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, so that's, that was another similarity I saw, um, which I thought was interesting because of our discussion on the Norn and their huge mm-hmm. um, similarities between the more Norse mythology. Yeah. Um, but anyway, yeah. So even after, back in Guild Wars, even after the gods... Um, have left you know even after their silence many of the humans still dedicate a large portion of their beliefs to their patron and also the other gods in general Mm -hmm. which i thought was very interesting um now the six gods actually do have correspondences um meaning like they correspond with certain aspects of things Mm -hmm. for example balthazar he corresponds with war and he and fire and courage so he could be called, you know, the god of war or, you know, the god of fire, or the god of courage. Duena um, corresponds with healing, air, and life. Grenth is darkness, death, and ice. Cormir is order, spirit, and truth. Lissa is beauty, water, and illusion. Melandru is nature, earth, and growth. I also found a few correspondences for Abaddon and Doom. Hmm. Abaddon um, is the god of secrets and the god of, and he was also a god of water, which I thought was interesting, because I thought Cormir may have taken that over, but Lissa's actually also she's the goddess of water. So I thought it was interesting that before Cormir came along, there were two gods of water, <laughs> but I guess that was just kind of like their element that they kind of went along with. Um, and Doom was the god of death and the god of judgment, and I'm assuming ice. Um, yeah. Now, here is always the thing I was really curious of, <clears throat> and I hope that I can find more information when Guild Wars 2 comes out. And I'm, I'm sure I can kind of, you, you all can kind of adapt this information to Guild Wars 2 professions. Mm-hmm. But I was always curious. Yeah, obviously, Balthazar's for warriors, you know, and, you know, Duane is for monks, you know, the obvious things like that. But there were certain aspects of certain professions that it was like, well, I have no idea who, what god this belongs to. Um, so here's, so I found out this Balthazar, <clears throat> when it comes, when it comes to Guild Wars one professions, Balthazar, um, uh, corresponds mainly with command and spear attributed paragons, fire elementalists, scythe dervishes, protection and smiting monks, as well as warriors, obviously. Mm-hmm. Duena corresponds mainly with air elementalists, monks who favor in uh, who uh, attribute in divine favor and healing and paragons who attribute in leadership and motivation and dervishes who attribute in wind. Grenth is for assassins, necromancers, ritualists, and water elementalists. Melandru um, corresponds with earth dervishes, earth elementalists, and rangers, obviously. And Lissa also goes along with assassins, goes along with energy storage elementalists, mysticism dervishes as well as mesmers mm-hmm. so well, take that as you will to apply that to guild wars 2 professions if you are playing a human and you're asked i was touched by which god when i was born mm-hmm. um use that if you're wanting that to correspond with the profession that you choose because i was playing a thief and i was like well i have i'm thinking grenth i don't know maybe <laughs> yeah. But you know, now that I know, it could either be Grenth or Lissa because the assassin is basically a thief. But if you're a, a, an elementalist, you can actually have multiple gods, I guess, since Balthazar is for fire. But an em- <laughs> elementalist can use air or you know water. Or 
Right. But, you know, most most people that I'm noticing tend to have, like, a favorite element. Yeah, definitely. Do, like, do you think that Koromir would correspond with, like, Ritualist then? I'm thinking so. And I also, obviously, they would, she would greatly go with Paragons. Like, pretty much any Paragon. Well, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I wonder, what do you think about, say, a Guardian? think Balthazar? Or you think... Uh, depends on how you're wanting to use it. Um, yes. I'm thinking Balthazar, Duena, For mainly protection. because... Of the, the yeah, thing. that's true. Um, and I'm thinking probably Cormir because of the whole truth aspect, and Guardians okay. are supposed to be like noble, very kind of like upright, and have a very hardcore moral code. Mm-hmm. And I'm thinking Cormir greatly corresponds with that along with Duena. So I'm thinking Cormir would be great for Duena... Um, Cormier Cormier would be great, great for Dwayne. I oh. Sh- <laughs> <I> sh- <laughs> <laughs> uh, OTP. Yeah, it's my OTP. <laughs> um, what about engineers then? Engineers? Ooh. See, this they don't really why, fit at all. This is why we need a engineer god. Mm-hmm. Laggy and I were talking about this. We need an engineer god. It's true. His name, well, what is it? Thomas? <laughs> yeah, Thomas. <laughs> Thomas, the god of engineer. Oh, the god of steampunk. That's what it was. Steampunk. Yes. Yeah. Like Thomas oh, Engine. I didn't even. Thomas think of Engine. That. Oh, I love god. that. God. <laughs> yes. Yeah. This is going to be a one-shot story. We can write this as a collective yes. group, the four of us. The main yes. Page. The tale of Thomas the- Engine. The lowly Surin engineer, or human engineer. You know, he's just he who will come across this Thomas. And he, he would pick him as his patron saint because he sacrificed himself in such a godly way. <laughs> or and, he'll and... try to convince everybody that it, this god exists. <laughs> yeah. Right. But he believes him. Like the, the flying spaghetti monster. Uh. Yeah. <laughs> Preach and Thomas. Like, actually. Yeah, and you'll go around exploring interior and you'll find like this little like makeshift shrine in the middle of the wood. <laughs> you know, like two Twigs. sticks of wood. <laughs> We should just run around and in Divinity's Reach all make a human and run around in all the different districts and just like start preaching the views of Thomas Engine, the engineer god. We'll I will to... do that, okay? Uh-huh. <laughs> I think we should flash mob it until it becomes a meme. Oh yeah, or, I think it or... should be uh, made with chars, though, if you relate it to steampunk and, you know, engineering and all that technology. I think it'd be well, best yeah, but the, if Thomas was a charm. Well, we'll I mean, spread it everywhere. Well, yeah. if you think about it, somebody had to help the char. I mean, the human gods, according to lore, gave all the races magic. Mm-hmm. Somebody had. We we talked about the char and how you know it was just time and natural evolution that gave them the ability to create massive steampunk airships and things. Nope, they just captured the human god thomas engine and that's where they got all the technology <laughs> who built ara in the first place thomas the engineer <laughs> he built it and doesn't get any recognition because the other gods took it all oh Bullshit. my gosh this is very uh, <laughs> matrixy like you know you have the art architect now you get the thomas <laughs> the engineer <laughs> yes <laughs> anyway <laughs> back onto the religion aspect of the game <laughs> with dint back to canon <laughs> Uh yeah, yeah. So yeah, like I was saying, you know, I said I found a bunch of similarities. Um, I'm noticing, you know, that a lot of the six gods can actually kind of go hand in hand with a bunch of the Greek and Roman gods. For example, Balthazar can obviously be referencing Ares or Mars, the god of war, mm. and Melandru can reference Artemis. Grenf, uh, I think it's pretty much hands down, can go to go with Hades. Right. Yeah. Now, Lissa, I'm think I'm torn between either Athena or Aphrodite. Uh, I would go because with... Lissa isn't really the goddess of death, but she or death. Whoa, the goddess of love, <laughs> but she is the goddess of beauty. Mm. Well, Aphrodite was kind of vain and about beauty <laughs> and that kind of stuff, so yeah. I, I would go with Aphrodite. Okay, and Duena uh, it can be Hera or Juno. Okay, yeah, that's fair. Yeah, I'm not sure what Cormier is, so if any of you have any ideas, throw them my way. <laughs> um, 
you know, this is basically based off of what each of the gods represent and their similarities to the deities found in real life mythology and what they represent. Mm -hmm. So that's where I that's where I drew most of that. Um, even though the you know it's only speculation based off of a few hints, it is you know this is definitely showing a pattern from Arena Net's tendency to grab inspiration from in real life references. Mm -hmm. Prime example being back from our Norn episode when we discussed the obvious correspondences between the Norn and the Norse mythology of our, you know, ancient Slavic cultures. Mm -hmm. um, and so moving on, um, I do want to touch just briefly on the White Mantle because they are humans, but they have a slightly different belief than most of the humans. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to touch on that a little bit. Given that the White Mantle are humans, I will discuss, albeit brief, their religious beliefs. The White Mantle were founded by Saul... D'Alessio. D'Alessio. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Who, by the way, looks exactly, exactly like my fiancé's father. <laughs> <laughs> First, kidding. my father looks like a Norn. Now, your fiancé's father looks like Saul D'Alessio. Nice. Mm -hmm. You have all those Guild Wars references in real life. That's awesome. I've, swear to you he looks exactly like him <laughs> exactly like him. anyway uh yeah so the white mantle they worship the mersat but um at that time they were only referred to as the unseen ones saul um first encountered the mersat while he was exiled in the maguma jungle and for an amount of time in return for being worshipped the mersat helped protect the crichtons from the char so everyone thought they were like, okay, yeah, cool. I'm down for that. Um, <laughs> you know, this was obviously back in the Guild Wars 1 time period. Um, however, while they were doing this, they were all, all of them were well aware of the Flame Seeker prophecies that you encounter and you learn about in the prophecies timeline in Guild Wars 1, which foretold the Mursat's inevitable downfall. Um, and the, the race known as the Seers, are basically the main foes of the Mursat. But they are... They're a really mysterious race, and almost nothing is known about them, even though you do come across one that helps infuse your armor in prophecy, so you could help fight the Mursat successfully without being, you know, becoming victim to their spectral agony. Mm -hmm. Now, speaking of the Seers, and I'm this is going to wrap up my, um, my religion thing... Uh, I think, obviously, I honestly think the seers are aliens because when you come across the seer, like, we, oh. uh, hopefully, I can post a, a screenshot of him or her or whatever. But it, it's a, it's a freaking alien. It looks very alienish, and uh, when you mentioned the seers, that's what I was thinking about. They're they're really they look like aliens, and they have four arms. Um, mm -hmm. they're they float. <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, so do the Mursat. Maybe they come from the yeah. same planet. Yeah. And like the Seer, the Char, and the Mursat are the human. Mm -hmm. You know. So is that. Uh... That's, that's it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, Dan. And we, we'll, we'll touch on that's Mursat and stuff more when we do the history piece. And we may end up even doing a full episode on that because there's so much from Guild Wars 1. Yes, there is. Um, uh, that, yes. that brings us to the history. Yeah, and Dent kind of touched on the whole how the human gods were brought to Tyria. They were, you know, an alien race, as it were, mm -hmm. um, and they brought them here. We don't know why or where from, mm -hmm. but that would be a crazy expansion, space travel, maybe. <laughs> oh my god, I don't know how that would fit well in a fantasy nope. slash realism game, and now, don't want. you know, with space travel, beam me up, Scotty, whoop, whoop, you know? <laughs> Uh, surrogates are that different? Shh. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. Serious. <laughs> Listen, Thomas the I... Engineer God will build a transporter, <laughs> and he'll be able to beam you up to, you know, the Starship Thomas Prize. I know, I know. But when you mention, like, space thing, all I can imagine I know, I know. are, like, spaceships and, you know, Star Wars and Star Trek and, and pew pew, laser beams, you know. I so, got you. Yeah. So I actually had a dream one time that the humans from uh, Guild Wars were from a post-apocalyptic world. Hmm. Huh. And they that's how they got there, where they were, like, marooned on, like, a ship. 
Are you Glint in real life? (laughs) Is this the Glint Seeker's Prophecies Part (laughs) 2? But actually, she would make a point. That would make sense. Um, You know, the gods just brought the humans on Tyria from that other world. If that world was dying, then that would be a very good reason to take them to another one. WTF, Melandrew. Where's the growth? <laughs> she was asleep. Uh, she, she was on break. <laughs> sick leave. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, and if you guys want to know more about uh, Saul D'Alessio and that kind of stuff, more in-depth, if we don't talk about it later, Wooden Potatoes, his most recent lore video, talks a lot about the history of Saul D'Alessio himself. Yep. So that's a good thing to check out. Yeah, it's very interesting. You mean my soon-to-be father-in-law? All right. <laughs> yeah, and, and you can always talk to Dan and have him uh, talk to Saul personally. He makes really good curry. There you go. Saul D'Alessio, <laughs> curry. Must have spent some time in Cantha, learned how to make some curry. Um, anyway. <laughs> so, Devine, you want to, and, and Alec Cardolino, whenever you feel like chiming in at all, you guys want to take the history piece here? Because you guys are mm-hmm. going to be, Alec Carolina especially, she's our, she's a human you know, tour bus machine for Syria, <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, of course, I'll talk about the history, but now, before I start, I just want to point out that there will be, uh, we will be talking about, you know, Ilona and Tyria, Kantha and all that in a separate podcast, because the human lore is so much, much too in-depth to explain everything in one single podcast. I'd literally be speaking for about two hours just talking about Tyria's human history. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'll be skipping a few things just so you know. So don't email me going like, no, you skipped that and you didn't explain. Blah, blah, blah. I know. It is meant to be that way, okay? So let's talk about the lore. Someone's having trouble with their mic? <laughs> Someone was, yeah. Yeah. It wasn't me. Wasn't oh. me. Okay. Well, it's somebody. It's Thomas. It's, it's, <laughs> you know that he's trying to patch his way into our our call to say like thank you for finally recognizing me. <laughs> Thomas and Jin. <laughs> Special gifts for you in Guild Wars, too, because you recognize me. Maybe we can pitch this to ArenaNet and make it canon, or at least make it like. Uh, like a special event character, like a joke thing. <laughs> yeah. But anyway, back to the history. Yeah, let's talk about the lore, about the humans' history as we know them in Guild Wars 2. So this is what you have to know before starting your your story as a human in Guild Wars 2. I'm not going to go into details about the gods, like, you know, Din just talked about, the, the magic and all that, because as I've said before... We'll talk about those things more in depth in another podcast, aside from the history of the gods that Din just explained. Um, It's important to know that the humans were brought to Tyria by the gods from the world of Tyria to the Tyrian continent. We often confuse the two terms, but they are different. Uh, But humans arrived on Tyrian continent in 205 BE, and BE stands for Before Exodus of the Gods, which we will talk in about in another podcast. (laughs) Um, When Guild Wars 1 ended, the humans were the dominant race. Now, it's not so much the case anymore. Uh, the human's war with the Char continued between uh, Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, and this you can read about in Ghost of Ascalon and Edge of Destiny. But basically what happens is that the human repeatedly lose ground against the Char. So from 1070 AE to 1090 AE, King Adelborn, uh, Adelburn, uh, Prince Rurik's father was able to maintain the tight grasp on Ascalon until the Char marched on Ascalon City. Uh, Adelburn saw that this was a war he couldn't win, but being the hard-headed and ever-so-proud king that he was, he was detriment to that if he couldn't win, the Char couldn't either. So he unleashed the foe fire with his ancient sword, Magdir. Is it Magdir or Magdare? I think it's Magdir. That's what Ritlock says. Magdir? Yeah, As- Ascalonian, yeah. I think it says Magdir. Yeah, I didn't pay much attention to the pronunciation. But anyways, people know what I'm talking about. Mm-hmm. Um, 
there are two versions of that story, though. The Char say that uh, he did this by plunging his sword into the ground, and the humans say that it was because his sword hit the claw of Khan Herd that we talked about in a Char lore episode. And the clash was so par- powerful that the faux fire was unleashed. Regardless, regardless sorry, which story is true, the faux fire happened and it killed all the chars around its per- parameter as well as all humans. Men, women, children, warrior, merchants, you name it. But it, uh, what it did was also to curse these humans and their spirits now roam Ascalon City. After the faux fire, Ascalon was completely controlled by the char, but the human fortress, uh, fortress of Ebon Hawk, which stands against the char to this day. Fast forward to 1127 AE. Kantha was united by Emperor Usoku, who drove all non-human races out of the Kanthan continent. Ever since that happened, it was very rare that any Kanthans would deal with Tyria. But when the minions of Zythan cut off sea routes to Kantha, all information was cut off too. Now, I just want to point out something. I've heard many times people saying, Oh, Kanta won't be accessible accessible in any expansions because it was submerged. It sank. No, Kanta is not underwater. I think people misunderstood something when, you know, it was said that Zythan awoke and created tidal waves, whatever. No, when Zythan awoke, undead corsairs blocked access to Kanta by seizing control of the trait Malkor. That's why you cannot access Kanta for now. But I'm I would also sure you like will. to point out something. Mm-hmm. Uh, they have said that Kantha is flooded, but there are still people in it. Mm-hmm. It's flooded, it's not underwater. Yeah, it's not submerged. <laughs> like, you can, if you were a Kanthan person, you could live there. It's just flooded a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Flash Think- flood. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm pretty sure that this is going to come up in an expansion later. Oh, yeah, I would have to think they would do that. Mm. Um, as for Ilona, after Palua Joko dammed the Elum River, a horrible famine swept through Ilona. In about 1135 AE, he had completely taken control of Ilona and Joko's stronghold in the Crystal Desert, making it near impossible to access Ilona via land, while Zythan makes it impossible to cross it by sea. So I'm thinking, you know, Ilona is probably going to be an expansion, but at a much later date, because yeah. you have to defeat either Palwa Joko's army or Zyth- <coughs> Zarthen. Mm-hmm. Um, Not to mention Krakatoric is over in that direction as well. Yeah, exactly. So you know, <laughs> I think uh, we're going to have to wait a little bit before we can access Ilona again. Yeah. Um, fast forward a little less than 100 years, so in 1219 AE, there was a great wave caused by Scython's awakening, and it smashed through Lion's Arch. It was completely destroyed, and it, and, um, it was abandoned as the capital. And when Lion's Arch was born again, it was founded by pirates, and it became a free city. So the humans were not solely in charge anymore. And when you visit Lion's Arch, you can actually go take a visit down under the sea to the submerged Lion's Arch. And you can find some pretty cool pictures on Project Tyria about that, which Alicardo took. (laughs) (laughs) Now, (laughs) I'm sorry, for the listeners, it's just a nickname I have for Alicardo Lina. It's because it was so complicated for me to say her name that I said Alicardo and it just stuck. She, it's, it's just because you're French. Yeah, it's because I'm French, so. <laughs> I'm not offended by it. <laughs> yeah, I hope not by now. You should be, you could be used. I think it's hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, back to the history now. About Krita. It was united in 1088 AE under Queen Salma. Uh, the new capital divinity's reach became the center of the human universe and their last hope to recover their feet, even as it continued to struggle against the centaurs and bandits. 
Divinity's Reach is what makes the human proud of who they are today in Guild Wars 2. They would die to protect it and their queen, Queen Jenna, who, by the way, is also a descendant of Queen Selma, and thus of King Doric, who was the first king of the United uh, Human Kingdom in Tyria. And that's a little tiny itsy bit about the human history. There's so much more to it. But like I said, we'll go into details in future podcasts. Questions like, where were the Shining Blade, blade founded? Uh, when did Logan Thackeray land a foot in the history of the humans as we know it? Uh, what's the difference between Ascalon and Krita and Or and, you know, etc. That's basically what you have to learn about the human uh, history before playing Guild Wars 2 and have a little bit of knowledge of where you're going. Should we mention anything about the rising of war? Yeah, how about it? Um, yeah. Oh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, so when the big uh, tidal wave happened from the dragon, mm -hmm. um, it caused war to to resurface because you know these are Karan had actually uh, sunk it. During the char attack, mm -hmm. so it, it's risen, but there's pretty much just undead there now, mm -hmm. and it was actually they had built the the city on top of the dragon's resting place, and so it, it is unearthed for Guild Wars Two. Right, and thank you for mentioning that because I completely forgot about that because Or sank. In Guild Wars 1, but now it's, you know, back up again. <laughs> right, yeah, that's because there was the three different factions of Char that attacked uh, the human settlements. There was, you know, Ascalon being attacked with Searing, well, for, Searing first, and then there was, uh, you know, the fights with, you know, the fight at Rin and breaking through the Northern Wall. Um, and like we mentioned, the, the Char attacked Krita, but thanks to the Mursat, and uh, the White Mantle, they were stopped there. And like Al Carolina mentioned, Basir uh, killed Bronn. He sank or rather than have it be taken by the Char. Which I think was a little bit of an extreme measure because, I mean, like, the White well, Mantle... Well, he was talked into doing it. Okay, well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so he sank or And, well, I don't like him anyway. He's kind of a jerk. But... Uh, <laughs> So yeah, Zaitan came up, and the tidal wave that sank Lion's Arch, and helped to flood, not completely submerge Cantha, also caused Or to rise up, and that's, you know, Zaitan being the dragon of undead, summoned all the dead people that had died when uh, Or sank as his minions, and this is actually the, like, the end game for the PvE content, and the, the, uh, the Twitch TV... Uh, live stream from ArenaNet, they talk a lot about how you know all the dynamic event webs they're calling them, where you go in, you fight all these things to eventually get to the final dungeon to then go in and fight Zaitan. But mm -hmm. I know uh, the most recent Tales of Tyria, they talk a lot about it. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna check that out because they talk about how it could be people that were complaining about not having a raid thing for the end game kind of content for PVE. Mm -hmm. This is like that only a lot lot better because it's dynamic and the events are always switching and changing so it's not the same kind of thing every time right so yeah that was my little piece there that's is that, interesting is that where we're at for uh <clears throat> for the history, history? Piece? yep well, Cardellina, do you want to throw in anything else for the human history no i think that's pretty much it um uh, a small nutshell. <laughs> All right. Um, didn't you have anything you wanted to say about history? Nope. Okay, then I guess we'll we we're gonna save a, a section here for the evil human faction, like we did for all the previous ones, the Sons of Sphenir and the the Inquest and all that. But for the human ones, there are several. There are the Separatists, which are the people that don't want the Char Human Alliance. And then again, there's obviously the the Mursat aren't gone, so the White Mantle are still a threat. 
but we really don't have a lot of information on any of them outside of that like they exist and I know if you're a char you do fight separatists in you know some of the char missions and kind of right in the plains of Ashford area. Oh yeah, because I, mm-hmm. I didn't play chars; I only played human, um, so I didn't know. I actually fought some of the separatists in the char area as a human, so you can fight them as pretty much any race, I think. Hmm. Yeah, I. Uh, that's actually what what I did when I was waiting for the final beta weekend event. I went was running around waiting for it to happen. I started doing missions, and one of them was to fight off separatists. It was by like a submarine or something. Oh yeah. Yeah, to help one of the char was trying to get their submarine to work. Huh. Need to fight off, but I don't think I ever fought separatists as a human. I had to fight them to get to the breach okay. to take my screenshots, and they just kept like demolishing me. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man. Shooting me with the guns. Hmm. Yeah, so... Uh, if we get more information in-game, well, we can always update, come back, and touch on the evil faction for the humans. But right now, we're kind of... Unless somebody else is out there, either here out with us on the podcast, or out there in the Guild Wars 2 fandom community wants to chime in and send us... Uh, links or information we can always mention you on our next podcast but i don't think there's much else well i was talking to jalinar we've Mm -hmm. mentioned him uh a few times in our podcasts uh today on our forums chat Mm -hmm. um and i asked him you know i i can't find anything on the separatists what do you know anything and he's like no there's not much known about them but if you're talking about the evil faction of the humans there are several of them Mm -hmm. But it's it, there's not much info about it, so my guess is, you know, we're just gonna start playing the game upon launch, and we'll we'll be able to know more about those when uh, game launches. Oh. All right. Well, yeah. I guess we'll have to wait and find out. I mean, so. if Jalinar didn't find anything, eh, and we're we're we won't. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So, I think that leads us up to the next piece, which is going to be my piece. We're going to talk on the human, the government of the human systems. And we know, you know, we learned quite a bit about that playing through Guild Wars 1, mm-hmm. and it's very apparent right up front in Guild Wars 2. But for those of you that don't know, Guild Wars and uh, the Divinity's Reach and the human settlements are ruled by uh, a, mon- uh, a, high, uh, a monarchy, and there's also a body of ministers as well. So the government represents all human nationalities, and this is ruled by Queen Jenna, who we kind of mentioned before. She's a descendant of Queen Salma. Mm -hmm. I'll talk about that in a little bit. Mm -hmm. So there's this minister group. I think it's called the Chamber of Ministers, and they design the laws and propose the laws to the queen, and then she has the option to either approve or reject them. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of similar to some modern-day governments that we we have out there but this was originally what i didn't know was a temporary governmental system for the refugee camps that were formed after lion's arts was flooded right but it's been around for so long and kind of became a cornerstone for Crichton culture that they're like well this is it works so why bother changing it so they stuck with it so the the government has three different army factions, if you will. There's the Seraph Guard, the Shining Blade, and the Ministry Guard. And I'll start with the Seraph Guard. They're essentially the police force for Krita. They keep everything in order. There's a bunch of different captains, and they run all different areas. Like, you'll have a captain that rules over this part of Krita, and he has his group of Seraph Guard, and they take care of this. And there's obviously the ones in Divinity's Reach... Um, they're run by Lo- or the captain of the Seraph Guard is Logan Thackeray, who's a former member of Destiny's Edge, and you can read you know about that in Edge of Destiny. And if you play a human, he's pretty prominent right from the beginning. You know, mm-hmm. your first mission, you run into Logan Thackeray. Yeah, he's a jerk. <gasps> mm-hmm. <laughs> he's not a jerk. I love Logan he's Thackeray. He's totally a jerk. <sighs> Naveen has a tendency to fall in love with the jerk. No. I was going to say the D word, but I don't like 
Are you going to say the... Or you, so I guess you're calling Rurik a jerk and Kost a jerk as well? Uh, yeah. Okay. I, I mean, I'm not just agreeing with you. But... I mean, D-words. I mean, jerks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> so, like I said, they pretty much are your, your police force. What I found that I didn't know is there is a group called the Fallen Angels which are a black uniformed group of Seraph that they aid the forces in Evanhawk. Oh, yeah. And they help further reinforce the, the truce between the Char and the humans. So I thought that was pretty cool. Wow. I didn't know that. Yeah, I don't think they're very well known. So The Fallen Angels. Yeah. Huh. They uh, have I... angels in Tyrion? Don't, don't they do, like, uh... Sorry. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't they also do, like, private missions, like, um, investigations and yeah. uh, kind of like a letter service and stuff like that? Yeah, and they're also, and the other part of the reason we don't know too much about it is they're in Ebonhawk. And if you play a human, you're all in Crita, Queensdale, that area. Yeah. And, I mean, if you read Ghosts of Ascalon, they make a whole point that, yes, there's the queen, but Ebonhawk's kind of ruled... Like, they know that there's a queen, and they acknowledge that she exists, but they're so far, and they've been fending for themselves against the Char, that they kind of have their own set of rules. Hmm. They they remind me a lot of, like, the CIA or the FBI. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, that's, I guess, yeah, we can call the Fallen Angels. Men in the black suits? Exactly, that's that's <laughs> the Fallen Angels, they're the men in black. Oh, <laughs> the <others too. gasps> Will Smith, yay! <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and uh, the I found that the the kind of wings that you see on the Seraph armor and the shields and things, they were inspired by the Paragons in Guild Wars One. So that's kind of cool. Um, I think that's just from a design purpose. I don't think there's anything in game to kind of back that up. Hmm. But at least you know the Paragons didn't make it into the game, so they so took some inspiration from them, which is pretty cool. Yeah, I don't think the Paragons were very popular in Guild Wars One, anyways. Yeah, and Alona's locked off to us anyway. So yeah. hey, maybe they're going to be a profession again. Uh, We're going to see I, men in skirts again. I doubt it, <laughs> but uh, we'll see. God, I hope so. <laughs> 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 so uh, the Seraph, you know, you pretty much you see all you know anywhere through the human story. So I'm not going to go too much into what's what's going on with them. Mm-hmm. I'll move on to the next one, which is one that I really knew pretty much nothing about, which is the Ministry Guard. Mm -hmm. And I spoke about the, there's that group of ministers that are kind of like the Congress, if you will, for uh, Divinity's Reach and the whole human settlement. And the Ministry Guard, you guessed it, they guard the ministry. (laughs) Um, They're the second. Really? Yeah. (laughs) The second largest group after the Seraph. So, but their job is not just to protect the ministers it's also to keep peace in between the ministers so if there's any kind of bad blood between two ministers they're there to make sure it gets settled Mm. Um, what pisses off the Seraph is they have jurisdiction over everything involving the ministry Mm. so if something goes on there's a murder involving the ministry whatever the Seraph have no control the ministry guard handles all matters to deal with that so they're headed by the commander of divinity's reach which we don't pretty much know anything about that or who it is or anything. So that they're just headed by that. And that person, the commander, speaks directly to the legate minister, mm-hmm. who it's the highest office that you can hold within the ministry. And they also the one that kind of runs back and forth between the ministers and the queen. And that is currently Cauticus the Wise, Cauticus Beetlestone. Um, and I'll talk about him in just a little bit. But I want to talk about the. Actually, you know what? I'll just talk about him right now. <laughs> uh, so he was the. He's the legate minister. So he's the head minister in Divinity's Reach. Uh, there's a carnival held in his name, so that made him win favor with a lot of the citizens of Divinity's Reach. Mm. He, he also helps. He's Codicus Beetlestone, so he's also a big part of and helping with the expansion in Beetleton. Uh, his home. His, his mansion is there, and there's a statue of him there out in, in Beetleton. And, oh, you know, that's who it is. Yep. And I his, was wondering. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, I was going to say his mansion is one of the dungeons. Ah, right. Actually, it's Cauticus's manor. <laughs> right. 
Um, I just imagine him having a dungeon in like his basement. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he's actually kind of this up and coming rival to Queen Jenna because a lot of people think that he should run uh, the human settlements, Divinity's Reach, and everything, and not Queen Jenna. And it really has a lot to do with her enacting the truce with the Char. And they kind of feel like she's soft and not really willing to take the kind of uh, the head-on approach and do what needs to be done. And she's all about peace and won't make the hard decisions. So I guess they're – I don't know what you call this group of people, but they're all about you know getting her thrown out of office and having him put in as the new leader. Hmm. And he has a sweet-ass robot. I don't know anything <laughs> about it, but I was looking him up, and there's like this – image concept art called Cauticus's Robot. Not Golem. It's called Cauticus's Robot. Yeah, I was gonna ask. Not Golem? It's a robot? It's called Cauticus's... I don't know. I mean, it's probably a Golem. I would be willing to bet that it's a Golem. But I... It's, he's a ro- It says Robot. Huh. Interesting. I wonder who built it. it was it him? Did, did, do you know? Or I all- It was Thomas. It oh, was- right. <laughs> I all I can tell you is it looks like an oversized golem. But rather than having that kind of big upside down pear shaped body with the little arms, mm-hmm. it's like a it looks like if you were to make a Norn a robot and make it steam powered, that's what this thing looks like. It's like the iron giant. I, exactly. Yeah. This is like, you know, and it even has what looks like a an orange arc reactor in like its stomach instead of its chest, so it could be like Iron Man Generation One armor right here. <laughs> um I don't know what it does. I'm assuming when we get into Cauticus's mansion, the actual dungeon, we'll probably encounter it. Uh, maybe. Maybe that's like the end boss for that. Oh, that would know. be sweet. So we'll see. Uh, to finish up the last group, which is the smallest, is the Shining Blade. And if you know anything about Guild Wars 1 and the White Mantle, you'll know who the Shining Blade are. But they are actually the, in Guild Wars 2, they're the Queen's personal guard, and they're sworn to protect the royal family. Hmm. And again, if you do any of the human missions, you'll encounter the Shining Blade pretty often. Right. And they're headed by Countess Anise, who is, I believe she's a Mesmer. But uh, can't remember. I but, thought she was Elementalist. No, yeah, she's a caster. We'll go with that. <laughs> of her armor. But what a lot of people in Divinity's Reach don't know, you learn this as the player... But they do a lot of covert missions, spying, uh, message delivery, similar to the Fallen Angels that we were talking about before. Mm-hmm. And what I found out, Countess Anise, who's the master exemplar of the Shining Blade, that position is picked by the current monarch. So for whatever reason, Queen Jenna picked her out specifically as the head of the Shining Blade. Hmm. And the reason the Shining Blade is the kind of personal guard for the royal family is all the stuff you do in the war in Crida in Guild Wars 1 where you and join up with the Shining Blade and you put Queen Salma back on the throne ever since then the Shining Blade has been considered the royal family's personal guard huh. so all you Guild Wars 1 players we helped make this happen yes yeah right <laughs> <laughs> well I don't know how if you guys feel that you know Legate Minister Cauticus should be the head then I guess you're like, why did I ever do that in Guild Wars 1? But if you're all for Queen Jenna, then good job. <laughs> uh, and I figure I'll talk just a little bit about Queen Jenna. Um, like you do meet her in, in Guild Wars 2, and she's also in mentioned in Ghosts of Ascalon, and she's also mentioned more heavily in Edge of Destiny. Um, it's mentioned, they actually were kind of leaked that she was one of the a Mesmer before they actually release the Mesmer as the final class. They kind of uh. mentioned it in Edge of Destiny about her using mesmerizing powers and things like that. Mm. So, again, she's the queen, uh, descendant of Queen Salma. Logan Thackeray is her personal champion, and they share this magical bond that she can call him to her whenever she's in trouble. That's weird. So, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Uh, it's just, you know, that makes me think about, you know, those teenage movies, like, or even like a True Blood, let's say, like, oh, I drank her blood, so 
If ever she's in trouble, I must go to her. Those teenage movies? What oh. are you, 75? I am. <laughs> Them teenage movies? Nah. Hoodlums, get off my lawn! But... <laughs> <laughs> but I'm sorry if I offended anyone. I It's not meant to, but I mean, all the Twilight and all that, I did not like those movies, and that reminds me just of that. Well, first of all, Read Edge, Edge of Destiny so you actually know what I'm talking about because you haven't, so it's in there. The book is in the mail. I'm going to get that this And week. Edge of Destiny, I believe, I don't know when the lore and Edge of Destiny everything came out in relation to Twilight, but let's just hope that it was prior <laughs> and that Twilight stole it from Guild Wars. Oh, Twilight stole for any for a lot of people. But, I mean, let's not get into Twilight because people are just going to stop listening to the show. Yeah, so anyway. <laughs> um, so yeah, she's the queen. Uh, she's got to deal with all the bandit attacks and all the centaur raids and all that. And on top of that, she has to deal with all the plotting against her from the ministers that want to get her thrown out and get Caudicus as the main one. Hmm. Um, I also found out that the Norn think she's weak. Oh, because yeah. Because they, they think she's too dependent on her advisors rather than taking care and charge of everything herself. Also, she's a mesmer, so hmm. the Norn probably are like, eh. You know, cast her with illusion magic. Finger wagglers. Yeah, exactly. And then there's a bunch of the Norn mesmers in Holbrook. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and, you know, another, we talked about it last time with the Char. And I don't want to spoil Ghost of Ascalon, but obviously she was very integral in the whole getting the claw of the Con Ur to make the truce between the humans and the Char. Mm-hmm. So she kind of pretty much spearheaded that whole thing. And there's. A whole piece, there was an ogre revolt, which I didn't really know much about. Uh, and that was another thing that she kind of helped give forces to end the ogre revolt, which I believe was with the Char as well. I really don't know much about it. Um, I mean, I could look it up, try to well, talk on it. but We'll probably do a podcast about it. Yeah. Uh, I know it had something to do, it was right after Krakatoric created the dragon brand. Mm. And it, they were working on the surrogate and Ebon Hawk, and I don't know. Um, it's actually uh, they were branded ogres from okay. the uh, the dragon, mm-hmm. and it's actually uh, part of Edge of Destiny. I see. That's it's been so there. while since I read it. That's the problem. Basically, they lay siege to uh, Ebon Hawk. Okay. Huh. Well, there you go. Look at that. Al Cardellina coming through in the clutch. <laughs> uh, I like my reading. Oh, you know what? And I do remember a little bit more about it now, and I don't want to talk much more about it because it'll spoil uh, Edge Destiny. Yeah. So That's why I'm kind of trying to be a little vague. Thank uh. you for stopping me there. So there you go. I don't want to talk too much more about it. Um, but yeah, I think that's pretty much it. Uh, you know, there's the struggle. There's a little bit of the struggle for power between the Seraf Guard and the Shining Blade. You kind of see that in when you play the human storyline, where Countess Anise and, and Logan Thackeray kind of are at odds with you know who has more power, who has the right jurisdiction for this and that, mm-hmm. and with Logan being the champion of the Queen, but the Shining Blade being the Queen's personal guard. You know, you have a little bit of animosity there, but I think that's pretty much it for the government piece hmm. so I guess that'll take us to I don't know do you have any speculation or any kind of things you want to discuss and talk about for the humans uh, I don't know mainly it's not any sort of speculation about what's going to happen in the future or anything like that but I don't know mainly just kind of like the speculation on the similarities between you know real life religion and their religion that's mainly because that was my segment, and so it feels like my baby, and so I got <laughs> lots of speculation about that. So, but I don't know. It's just I feel. I mean, it it can't be denied the fact that they clearly grabbed from Norse mythology for Norn, mm-hmm. which is awesome. I think because I'm a mythology buff, and I've I loved finding that out. But I don't know. It's just. I don't know if they just kind of like used the Greek and Romans as kind of like a template to build th- the mythology that they have for the humans or if the 
or if they just like flat out like use it as like inspiration. But I don't know. I'm just I'm curious if because with Norn there's references everywhere to exactly. it. Exactly. Yeah. But here with us, uh, us as in the humans, uh, you know, it's only like it's only it's only here and there. So I'm curious if we're gonna find more um, examples at all. Probably. I mean, they they there's a lot of reference to you know uh, the Norse mythology and everything on basically you know Norn and like you said the religion and. I'm pretty sure they're going to come up with something. I think someone out there who's writing for the lore really likes Norse mythology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I wouldn't be I surprised to Jeff see Grubb. something else. Yeah, most likely. I get a feeling it's Jeff Grubb. Yeah. Reese Osby seems to be Silvari based almost entirely. Mm-hmm. And, human- and she does a lot with the humans too, but yeah. So, all right. Well, that, thank you, Dent. Yeah, it is. it is very apparent that they like to Use well. I mean, it's clear where a lot of their inspiration comes from. Mm-hmm. So that's um, right. Uh, I actually have something, uh, some food for thought. Um, sure. Ooh. So, if you go to the Temple of the Ages, which is underwater now, mm-hmm. you see that uh, Joanna's statue mm-hmm. has not fallen apart. Mm-hmm. It mm-hmm. actually still has the light going through it and everything. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's right, yeah. So, the gods still favor the world. Huh. Huh. <gasps> you, Alucard. Let's see, this is why we brought her in for this one. <laughs> <laughs> but she makes a good point, and no, you know does. what? I, I didn't, didn't even that notice. That completely left my mind. And I have that screenshot. I took a lot of screenshots about the statues and everything, and I noticed the light, but I didn't, you know click about it. Connection. Yeah. Well, isn't there like a skill point there too where you commune with the statue and that's the skill point? Yeah, uh, it's not with the statue, but it's like in between all of the statues. Yeah, and right. I think uh, Melandru still has leaves on her. There's, mm-hmm. I don't think there's water still flowing through it, but I think there are still leaves on her. Huh. So well, maybe... isn't she the only one that didn't actually like fall down in the water? Yeah. Hmm. Um, so... It maybe makes me, you know, wonder if some of the gods don't favor the world since they're not, you know, lit up and doing their thing, but some of the other gods are still listening. I wonder if there's a dispute between the gods. Maybe. And that's That's why they're not, you know, talking or showing interest in TD humans right now. Maybe they're just trying to fix that dispute. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we See, even... I knew we could find a speculation about something. Well, we wouldn't <laughs> even really know about Cormier because she didn't have a statue at the Temple of Ages. No. Yeah. So she... Right, like maybe they like let her in and now they're like totally regretting it. They're like, wow, really? We let this bitch <laughs> in? And now, they're, like, now they're fighting constantly because she's like hitting on Duana's boyfriend. Or... <laughs> Are you and kidding me? Like, she right, couldn't let's tell what's outside. She, couldn't e- she can't even see. How's she going to do anything? <laughs> Hey, she was battling pretty good with, you know, a blindfold. <laughs> she goes well, on I know, but she's a ticket of spear and waving, waving, it, waving it around, so, I mean, she's bound to hit someone. <sighs> That's what happened. She came in and killed, like, most of the gods. Yep, she just chucked yeah. her spear at a bunch of people and was like, oh, I'm sorry. Thomas is staying out of it. Yeah. Right. <laughs> One of my favorite that- gods is Cormier, actually. Now... I may be liking the jerks. <laughs> yeah. That's all right. We like the underdog, Thomas Engine, the yeah. engineer god. Exactly. And Doom. And Doom. Yeah, I love Doom. Although Bo- Bo- I Doom. wouldn't be a fan of, of if Doom was the god of death because I wouldn't want to have permadeath on my character. Yeah, that's true. I mean, he's he's got some social issues to work on. <laughs> I mean, he but, I mean, didn't allow Mad King Thorn to exist, so that's also cool. That's true, yeah. But, I, I mean, he... King Thorn, his lore, anyway. Yeah, his lore is awesome. Oh, speak. Okay, well, here's a good speculation thing that we've already touched. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I figured we should save that for Halloween. Okay. Okay. Ah, uh, they were teasing everybody. Ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think... 
think if nobody else has any, or Al Cardellini, you seem to have everything you've brought up today has been like gold. So what else do you have? Do you have anything else? Um, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, to be honest. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, Naveen, how about you? Nope. Dent? Nope. And I don't think I have anything else other than, um, you know, whenever we do make our merchandise, I'm going to make sure we get a Thomas the Engine. Uh, <laughs> Thomas Engine, the engineer god, we're going to make sure he's featured prominently on a t-shirt at the very least. Yes. Yes. Now uh -huh. I just think about Thomas, you know, the train, the kids show? Yes. Thomas <laughs> the Engine. The, that's the reference. <laughs> Uh, so I, you know what? I'll, let's put it out there to all the, the fan artists in the community. What if somebody, we'll see. We'll you know maybe we'll even make a contest out of it. If people want to draw us Thomas Engine, don't make him a train. He can be on a train though. A steam <laughs> Thomas Engine, the engineer god. Why don't you? And you've seen the concept art and how grand and cool they make all the gods look. See if you can't come up with something cool like that for Thomas Engine, the engineering god. I'm gonna open up MS Paint. There you go. We got see, <laughs> look. You better hurry. We got Al Carlini is already on it. So I'm gonna put my tablet to work. Yeah. So I'll throw it out there. I All mean, things. Of them. Yeah. <laughs> things you're gonna want to throw in there. I mean, he's an engineer god. So backpacks, flamethrowers, you know, steampunk, clockwork, whatever. Mm -hmm. Just to have Guys. at sonic screwdrivers. I don't care. Whatever you want, <laughs> just throw it in. Um, sonic screwdrivers. Yeah. Why yes. not? Is that a movie? <laughs> no. So is that a movie? <laughs> oh, God, quick, we better end this before all the Doctor Who fans start hating on Dent. Oh. <laughs> I was thinking more of uh, Scrubs. Oh, I was thinking more Doctor Who, given the song. <laughs> but, uh... I was not thinking anything. And that's why we love you, Naveen. Imagination. Uh -huh. <laughs> SpongeBob references. Yep, I love. <laughs> All right, let's 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 <laughs> cut this out. We're off on ridiculous tangents. So I think, unless anybody has anything more relevant to human lore, we'll close this out. Uh, no, I just want to end this with saying thank you, Alicardo, for joining for joining us on the show. It was really great having you, and you brought up a lot of points that we wouldn't have if you weren't there. It's true. Did you have fun? Yes, I had loads of fun. Great. Yay. See, and then like we said, you guys can join us in game. Unfortunately, Dent won't be with us, but you can join us in game on Wednesday for more crazy antics. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and I wanted to, we forgot to say this yesterday, but I want to... Wednesday what date? Wednesday, I'm sorry, Wednesday, July, July 18th. 18th. As in two days from today. At 8.30 Eastern Time. Lions Arch. AM or PM? PM. <laughs> Thank International, you. International District <laughs> 1 by the fountain. Um, but yeah, I wanted to shout out and thank you to ArenaNet for giving us beta keys. Oh, definitely. Seriously. Um, and that was awesome. And Al Cardellina was one of the winners of yes. one of our beta keys. Yeah, and she's the only one who said thank you, by the way. <laughs> People who won. Not replied with, hey, thank you. Ah, uh, you're welcome. It's so nice to give keys out for people who want to play in a boodle. It means a little We bitter. only gave you access to the best game in the Recent. world yeah. ever. Yeah. See my inbox fill with, oh, thanks, Naveen. You're welcome. <laughs> Yeah, she's too busy dealing with the inbox from the guild rooster. <laughs> Come anyway. on! Come on! Why anyway. are you hating? <laughs> so, I guess since that's pretty much it before we keep going too long again, which we already have, I'm sure. Yes! Uh, yeah, I know. We're probably at like two hours right now. And now we're uh, five minutes. Not bad. Okay, not too bad. <laughs> so... Again, thank you, Al Cardellina, for coming out. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to Chronicles of Tyria podcast. If you like our show and you want to encourage us to keep doing it, please subscribe. Uh, we're going to do our next big thank you episode with whatever kind of special thing we're going to do is going to be when we hit 100 subscribers. We're at and I will be there this time. You will be there. Hear that? You heard it here first. Dent will be there. 
Uh, we're at 62, I believe, subscribers right now. So when we hit 100, we'll have to come up with something else fun to do. And by then, maybe we'll be in Guild Wars 2, maybe not. Uh, so again, thank you all. And we're going to, I guess we'll kind of close this out. So I am Lagwin. I'm Dint. You're always late. I'm Naveen. <laughs> Should I say something? Yeah, yeah. definitely. <laughs> I'm Alu Carolina. And we'll see you next time. <laughs>